Welcome to Mosaic Minds, the podcast where every episode is a colorful blend of perspectives, ideas, and conversation. Each week, our diverse team of hosts brings their unique backgrounds, experiences, and interests to the table. Mosaic Minds is your invitation to join the conversation to see the world through a kaleidoscope of viewpoints. So grab a seat, tune in, and let the mosaic unfold before you. Let's do it, Nick. All right. Welcome back to Mosaic Minds Podcast. We have an incredibly special guest, Ross Jeffries, with us today. And Ross has revolutionized the world of seduction and dating coaching. He's a pioneer in the field, a mentor to many, and someone who has left an undeniable mark on the industry. Our guest was mentioned in Neil Strauss's bestseller, The Game, a book that kind of took the underground community and brought it to the mainstream in the 90s. And while Ross didn't really play a role in the book necessarily, he was mentioned, and I'm going to guess that... Actually, I did, if I could oh, pause you. yeah, absolutely. I play a role in the book. I wasn't featured as prominently as Mystery, but I played a significant role. So. Okay. Well, I was going to say that uh, whether whether you played a role in it or not, I have a, I have a feeling that you probably... Um, Benefited a bit from the book over the years, right? I definitely did. <laughs> with it, he's got some um, groundbreaking method techniques of his own. He uh, came up with speed seduction, which was um, kind of based on NLP or neuro linguistic programming. Uh, I know that Ross has a passion for language, and I think you, hypnosis is something that you've always been into as well. And recently, Ross has taken his expertise into the realm of sales with his new book, The Subconscious Sales Advantage. And um, today, I think he's going to uh, he's going to share with us possibly a free promotion or something that he's doing with the book. So no, 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 no. no. If you check out the, I just learned. I'm, see, I'm keeping up with the new thing. <laughs> These QR codes. If you scan them, you'll get instant access to your free uh, ebook copy of my new book, The Subconscious Sales Advantage. Okay, great. Which great. is packed, which is has five different principles that you can use to easily increase your sales by a huge leaps in a very short period of time in a way where your prospects will never see it coming because it goes right to the subconscious mind and your com com excuse me your competition doesn't know about it. okay well no, I, I didn't realize um that there was, an, so once uh, you agreed to be on the show, I obviously started doing some research, and I didn't realize what a huge um, subculture the the pickup community was. <laughs> and maybe maybe not so much now, but it seemed like especially like in the '90s. I, I don't know if it's as big now as as it was, but I I just didn't yeah. realize what a huge subculture and and band of brothers that that it kind of was. So. Um, I'm guessing that a lot of our listeners probably don't, maybe don't even know the term pickup. So is, could you kind of just give a synopsis of like the background, like kind of the origin and evolution of, of pickup and seduction? Okay, there's sort of multifold thing? answers. There's a lot enfolded in that question. So let me unfold it and, and get it out into the light of day. Okay. I don't consider myself a pickup artist. I consider okay. myself someone who teaches the art of seduction of course, embedded in that has to be the skills at <clears throat> meeting and intriguing women very rapidly. And also, I consider myself to be a healer. A lot of the people who come into the community, who come to courses, seminars, boot camps, have a lot of trauma. And I think if you take someone who's got a lot of trauma, and we can dive into what those are later, and you try to squeeze them into any system then they're still going to be bringing that trauma into their interactions with women, no matter how powerful your system is. So one of the distinctions between myself and all the people who are there early on from 92 to all the way through the mid 2000s, none of them had any recognition what to say a system or process for guys who are very wounded to do some healing at the same time they're learning the skills of pickup and seduction. So, and that's one of my objections to the book, The Game, is that Neil Strauss put quite rightly portrayed all of my warts and flaws, but he never 
showed the side of me that genuinely cared for my students and did healing work. Yeah, I thought that I thought that in the book um, it was a uh, was a very much less than fair portrayal of of what I have learned about you. So I mean, I could I obviously I wasn't there, but I mean that, that's kind of how I felt about the way that he kind of. I don't feel you know, wounded by it, Nick. I think I, in fact the Ross Jeffries persona is very very grandiose, argumentative, nasty, and I look. As a public figure, I stick my head out and say, take a swing, take a swing. Your hate makes me stronger. My objection is my students are not public figures, and Neil took a swing at them. He called them greasy-haired fools. Mm, yeah. And that's a cheap shot. There's no need to do it. And he's taking swings at people who ought not to be shamed for wanting to learn these skills and wanting healing. They ought to be encouraged and praised. Right. So that one, he's a fuckhead for that. <laughs> Well, as, as being one of the founding fathers, um, how did you how did you first get interested and in start yourself in, will, in the? I will answer that question. And as an interviewer myself, I have my own podcast, The Influencer's Edge. I don't ask that question to my guests until I first ask, "What's kept you passionate about it?" I'm around where the beginning people uh, when I was starting out they're not there anymore or they're doing other things now i'm doing other things too as you'll see when you download the book the real interesting question is what's kept me passionate about it after all these years and i'm still creating new stuff how is that possible i wrote my first book in 1988 what is it that drives me to keep doing this and i think how i did it is just factual dry history i'm not how i did it but what got me started i think that's the more and I am, you know, correcting, not correcting, but adding something of value to the exchange here by asking you to ask me that question. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So what, well, then what is it? You know, what, what has kept you passionate about it over the years? Yeah. I'm wildly creative. Just, I can't stop except when I'm really exhausted physically. And even then I can do it. I'm wildly creative not necessarily a good thing because people who are visionaries and high creatives don't always follow through or monetize what they're doing. Fortunately, I have team members to track it and do that, all that for me. We just brought on someone else for my AI. I have a seduction house, speech seduction AI that I sells all that, my yeah. performance. So I don't have to do the work anymore. I still have private clients come out for healing work, but it is exhausting. I had just finished with someone last night. I'm I'm a little tired from that. I am restlessly creative. I'm restlessly and relentlessly curious about what makes people tick, not just women, but what makes people tick. And my I have an ulterior motive, a uh, hidden motive, which I'll expose right now. When you're deeply in love, you want the people you care about to at least like the person that you're in love with. I'm deeply in love with language, always have been. Uh, when I was a kid in grade school, I don't know if you remember diagramming sentences, if you had to do that mm -hmm. noun, verb. I loved it. I didn't want to go for recess when the bell rang. I wanted to do more diagramming. I'm in love with language, madly in love with its power to structure consciousness, shape decisions, and drive behavior. And that, by the way, is the essence of whether you're seducing or selling or persuading or influencing, which is structuring states of consciousness we, we can dive into that a little bit later so and finally i believe i was put here for this reason which is to that may sound grandiose but i really believe it that i was put here to do the job that no one else can do that poor fucker i worked with yesterday he had been to an nlp practitioner for 12 13 years who got him nowhere nowhere I took care of him in an exhausting evening. He came out for dinner and then all day yesterday and then a little bit in the evening until I finally broke through what his real troubles were. Now, I did in a day what that NLP person couldn't do in a dozen years. That's the kind of work that I believe I was put here to do. It's exhausting, but I still find the energy to do it. I think NLP is so fascinating. I I wish that I live in the Midwest, so you know that's a little airy fairy for our you know for out in the Midwest. It's hard to find somebody you know out here that that is an NLP practitioner. At least that I've found. I've I've looked, um, 
there was a, the only person that I know of, there's, have you ever heard of Mark Singh? He does the Unapologetic Man podcast. Nope. Sounds like an interesting dude. Make an introduction, please. So he's, um, he does, he's a dating coach, but he also uses NLP, but his, his version, it's a little bit different instead of, um, nece- instead of using it like necessarily toward women, he goes in and does customized um, NLP protocols with his clients to kind of you know get rid of those those embedded programs from when they were kids yeah. or whatever and yeah. and and replace sure. them on well, top of giving the dating advice. Good for him. Yeah, very interesting. And and I wish he would just take regular clients, but he'll only take people that are interested in you know in picking in pick up and that sort of thing. Good on him. Anyone who's helping men. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, a bit difference from yourself and others in the seduction community. We were already kind of talked about NLP, but what I know we talked about the passion, but what first got you into NLP and what, what sure. made it occur to you to put that <laughs> in Well, the I was looking for a solution to my own problem, which is I couldn't get laid in a woman's prison with a fistful of pardons. <laughs> I, was, I don't even want to think about it, but I was filled with shame about my body. I had no social skills. And cut to the chase. Someone introduced me to Richard Bandler in NLP. It's a long story. I, I don't have the energy and it's not worth the time of your viewership or listeners to go through it. But I fell in love with it immediately. I saw what it was really about. I had a deep insight into it, which I shared with Richard Bandler, the co-founder and my mentor. And he got that I got his baby. And so you actually, right oh, away. so you actually met, you knew him, you knew Richard Bandler. He trained me. Oh, okay. he, I did not know he, that. Okay. Yeah. He took me under his wing. He liked me a lot because he knew that I was getting his box of toys. He got it. Everyone else was, you know, the metaphor, did you ever see the Bruce Lee movie or the scene from the movie where he says to the student, he's pointing to the moon and, his, and the student gets it wrong and Bruce Lee smacks him and said, you are looking at my finger while I'm pointing to the moon. <laughs> Don't look at the finger or you will miss all the heavenly glory. So while everyone else was looking at the finger, I saw the heavenly glory is a terrible term for what he was actually doing, the essence of his genius. And for that, I think he, he I know, because I had him on my podcast, the Influencer's Edge, and he flat out said it. And so that began me on a journey of mapping over like a two or three year journey of because there was no NLP model for seduction. There was one for hypnosis. There was one for selling, but there was none for seduction. And that I had to, I'm a smart fellow. I'll give myself credit for that. I think it's evident to anyone who's in the audience right now, they can pick up on it. I, it took me about two or three years of, experiment and trial and error before I first came up with the first early versions of speed seduction. And the interesting thing is those versions worked, but they're kind of clunky and long and had long language patterns to memorize. So over the years, I revised it and cut it down and cut it down and cut it down to make it powerful enough that it will work within like half an hour to an hour, even if you're not a woman's type or you don't have social status or money or looks, even with the age gaps. Now the age gaps are a little bit more, requires a different skill level. But my last girlfriend was 41 years, 43 years younger and far hotter than I am. <laughs> See, I'm glad you said that. Cause I, that was something I was going to bring up too, is I, I tend to date women that are younger than me and I get, I get shit for it. You know, like my, I'm, I just turned 44 and my, my last exclusive girlfriend, she was, she's 23 so you know i get what do you say what do you say to people that that say that it's you know never had any uh, you know what uh if if anyone has a problem with it which is very rare i fuck with them i (laughs) (laughs) i was involved with this stunning very playful swedish girl i met her when i was 49 and she was 19 she's a teenager i imported her out here from sweden that means I love Sweden. And so we had this thing. If anyone would say, is that your father? She would say yes. And that was her signal to grab me by the shirt and thrust her tongue down my throat and for us to like make out like crazy. <laughs> or if anyone would say, is that your daughter to me? I'd say absolutely. And that was her sign to jump on me. That's you know, funny. I'm not, uh, I'm, 
think they're what I call egg envy hags. These are women whose ovaries have shriveled up and they don't like to see reproductive, reproductively healthy young women snagging the men. So I don't give a fuck or they're moralizers. Why would I care? It's hardwired into us as males to be attracted to young, fertile, beautiful women. It's hardwired. Yeah, because we're meant to, that's, we're created to, you know, procreate. And so, you know, it's going to be in the back of our head always, our subconscious. I don't know that I believe we were created, but it serves the cause of evolution for us to have those drives to procreate. Okay, fair enough. Fair enough. All right. Yeah, I mean, I, I was just, I was just curious because, you know, I, I see these posts all the time on Facebook. Like there was one recently with, uh, you know, who uh, Anthony Kiedis is of um, Red Hot nope. Chili Peppers. So he's nope. he's uh, he's about I don't know he's probably about sixty six, sixty five. Oh, flea. He's flea. He's right? not not flea, not flea. He's the other. He's the singer. Okay. So so flea's the base the basis. But anyway, he was at a, a basketball game with um, his his nineteen year old girlfriend. And I just see all – now, I don't know that I would date that young because, I, I mean, I kind of want, like, a fully developed no, brain. No, I but, wouldn't either. But, I mean, like, you just see all the stuff on him about, you know, how this guy is – this guy's clearly, you know, into into children and this and that. And I'm just like, oh, guy alone, It's a she's a consenting adult, you know? <laughs> I mean, leave him alone. Just point out to them that Mary, Jesus' mommy, was around 14 or 15 when God knocked her up. <laughs> how do you think that some of these uh some the fact that there's these dating apps out now um you know which which i use i actually I, I went on a first date last night from someone i met on tinder so how do you, you think know that what it's funny i'll answer that question right now i'll step on you a bit and answer it so i was working with this client and my friend anna volunteered to have me demonstrate some things and anna was saying you know what guys don't talk to me anymore not because she, uh, they don't talk to my girlfriends either. And her, we're all attractive because guys want to do everything online. The guys that's got the balls to actually approach and have a conversation and put his balls on the line, so to speak, I don't believe that's what's really happening. I'm using a bad metaphor. Immediately gets attention just for the fact that he has that much guts. And he's giving women the dopamine hit of getting attention. Now you have to do it in a way that's not creepy. Let yeah. me circle back to, uh, to something I said. I haven't approached a woman in at least 10 years. And I teach my students not to approach. And that sounds paradoxical, but here's what I mean. I never approach. I only extend the gift of my masculine presence and extend opportunities to connect with me in fun and powerful ways. So I don't approach. I extend I joyfully extend opportunities to connect with me in fun and powerful ways. Notice the difference in that languaging. If I say I got to approach that girl, it's implying that she could reject me or pain could be in the equation or, or I'm sort of like a sex beggar and she's got the coin she's going to give me. But when I say I only extend, I only joyfully extend opportunities to connect with me in fun and powerful ways. That's me generally giving value. And then I have to worry about rejection. Mm -hmm. So a language is very powerful. You get the cognitive reframe there? Yeah, yeah. Like so so in other words, instead of you're looking at it more as you're you're giving something rather than taking. Correct. Now, in order that for that to be true, you have to change your beliefs about yourself. You have to step into different vibes that attract women. So within the space of two minutes of a conversation, I will reveal to a woman the sides of me that are vulnerable, the parts of me that are very powerful, even controlling, the parts of me that are fun and playful, and the parts of me that are genuinely curious. I'm demonstrating emotional intelligence. Women are very attracted to emotional intelligence if it's paired with strength. If it's paired with weakness, and by weakness I mean you have no will, you let the woman take the emotional lead. If strength is you set the emotional lead and even a little bit of the will to power, a little tiny taste of the will to control because that control that's based in a sense of safety is really, really hot. My friend, my dear friend, Christine, who I once demonstrated on, who had no attraction to me after doing a little bit with her, she said, my vagina is tingling. I said, really, tell me more. But she said, you know, when I talk to you, it feels like I'm being cradled. 
like in a hammock. And that makes me safe to feel all sorts of crazy, wild feelings. I said, yeah, it does. Don't you? So, so how do you do that in a, in a matter of two minutes? I mean, is, is that is that a or is that a trade secret that you can't like? Can you give give me an example of, of what? That, you know what? Instead of paying me twenty five thousand dollars, ask my AI. The AI has been trained to answer as close to me, and my team is continually training it. Well, I'm, I'm having a meeting with them on my part, my business partner's boat in about two hours, three hours, and. We, We've trained that AI. It's speedseduction.ai. Okay. It's seven days for free. Start your free trial. I don't have it here on my screen because I am promoting my book today. But go to speedseduction.ai, seven days free, cancel within seven days and see for yourself. I'd rather not go into it. That's the whole point of having the AI so I don't have to talk to people anymore. Unless I screen them and I know they're not broken, they don't have emotional problems, they're just looking to do a lot better and they have a lot of disposable cash to throw at me yeah ai is amazing i i mean i i don't know if i had if there was chat gpt and that kind of stuff around when i was in school good lord i mean i i, <laughs> I hate yeah, writing papers you know, so. <laughs> it's, it's, it's nice and it certainly has its benefits but it also could turn out to be something that kills human creativity or certainly discourages right. Yeah, we did, we actually did an episode on that about you know the benefits and and detriments of or potential detriments of of uh, AI. Mm -hmm. Yeah, interesting stuff. I mean, it's crazy, and I assume it just kind of learns from itself. The more you, the more that um, people ask questions and put in there, it just kind of learns from itself. Yeah. On there. and we also update it in, our, in its training. Does now when on your uh, on the speed seduction thing, whenever people entered in, you said it answers like you. Is it text or is it does it do a right like now? It's audio? text. Right now it's text, but I don't want to talk about our plans for it. That's well. I tell you what. Why don't you uh, Why don't you kind of go into what you're you're doing now and talk? We'll talk a little bit about the parallel between sure. um, you know seduction and, and sales and and what you're doing these sure. days. So now what I do is I work with extremely successful like. You have to be as close to seven figures as you can get. People like that. I only take a handful of VIP clients and I work with them and I teach them sort of how to seduce to sell. I think the parallel between seduction and sales is very, very good one. If you stop and think about it, at least in my model, it's about capturing and leading the imagination and the emotions. And it's really not selling a product or service. It's selling a decision and a good feeling about decisions or good feelings about decisions. Think about it like this. I teach salespeople, you'll never sell again after learning from me. You're not a salesperson. You're a decision service technician. <laughs> <laughs> and that's a nice reframe you're laughing at. I think it's funny, but it's true. So decisions are actually based on states of mind, states of consciousness. So my system says, okay, if I want to jump on a lady, I first have to create states of focus on me, states of feeling intrigue, states of fascination, arousal, desire, act on it now, incredible connection. I don't want to aim at those for someone who I'm selling something to. But what I do want to aim at is using my language very rapidly to create focus. You see, the number one challenge, I don't know if it's going to show up on my, do I have to back up to show it or you know, here I'm holding up my smartphone for those who can't see it. Your number one block to being successful in sales is not your competition or a lack of discipline. Those may be in there, but to me, your biggest competition is your prospect's inability to focus. You don't have an hour to build rapport because people can't focus anymore because of Instagram and all the different apps that are designed to be addictive they were designed to be make people dopamine dependent on them mm -hmm. because of all of that people have attention spans of a goldfish metaphorically so i don't have time and you don't have time if you're selling anything you don't have time to spend an hour or even 15 minutes getting rapport that's one thing so the currency of any kind of persuasion whether it's political whether it's influencing or persuading your spouse or kids or selling or seducing, the currency of that is focus. 
if you can't create that intense focus, then you're going to be in trouble. It's going to be a lot more work than it needs to be. Now, I cannot walk up to someone and say, Mr. Smith, in a minute, I'm going to give you hypnotic-like suggestions where you will develop a state of focus, where you will hear only my voice, and only what I say will be real. Ready? One, two, three. I can't do that. But through conversational hypnosis, that's actually my wild claim is that that's easily done in a way that's not detectable consciously. Now, it's not necessarily the easiest thing to do. It's like learning a new language. But I'll give you an example of how I would do it. So, oh, there's one other factor that no one else addresses. No one. And I've seen some pretty good sales courses. I've been on other salespeople's podcasts and had them on mine. It's this. If you're in sales, you've been taught no like, and trust. You've got to get the potential client or prospect or whatever to no like, and trust you. Well, the problem nowadays is no like, and trust is no longer enough. You've got to get that focus, but more importantly, You've got to get that prospect to trust themselves, trust their own ability to make a great decision. And they just don't any because they're overloaded, overstimulated, dumbed down, numbed out. And they have culturally induced, uh, technology induced ADD, HD. So it's a whole different set of problems neurologically and contextually that Every other modern sales system I see just seems to ignore. They're assuming that the prospect can focus on, on their system, assuming the prospect will trust themselves enough to make the, the great decision. And so I say, and some people could say it's manipulative. I say, thank you very much. I worked very hard to make it powerfully and effectively manipulative. Doesn't mean it's destructive. I say, learn to use your language to do that. So let me give you an example. I would say, before we begin our exploration together today, I'm not sure all the points where you might stop and feel a sense of growing focus as we continue to explore. But as that's taking place, can I ask one favor? Will you promise me you'll share the questions that naturally arise when a great decision is being made? Wow. <laughs> people come in their guard is so so up whenever they sense the slightest possibility of sales so yeah i mean if yeah if you can you know if you can do that through language i think that that is certainly the key yeah and there's a lot of things in there and i go through i go into the book which you can get for free you can also get it on amazon for seven bucks but why not grab it now it's free uh there's a lot in included and embedded in what I said. So it has in it what I call implied relationship words. I said, before we begin our, so we and our already imply that it's an activity we're doing together. Before we begin our exploration together, we our together. So now we're all already on the same side of the table. We're implying that. They have to unconsciously buy into the presupposition that, oh, we're on the same side. Instead of saying, before I present our marketing plan, I just want to ask you to please ask any questions to help you understand uh, all the benefits and features. No, that doesn't do it. Or maybe yeah. people start out with a joke, which isn't bad, or start, which isn't bad. But I prefer to include the stories after I've told this, after I've done this. So we ask together, we are together, but then there's a really powerful word, explore. See, one of the things I want to aim at is not getting rapport. Rapport is only useful if it le leads to compliance. I want to get compliance. I want them to comply with me. So when I say the word explore or exploration, First of all, exploration implies a valuable activity. And more importantly, for every exploration, there must be a leader. And for every leader, there must be, starts with the word F. A follower. Right. So by absorbing that, they're buying in on the unconscious level that they are your followers. 
you're not just someone who's educating them or trying to sell them. You're their leader, which makes them really compliant. So we're cramming in so many hypnotic tools in the space of a sentence. And this is why the VIPs, the handful of VIPs I work with, pay me well. I, I am the most expensive trainer, mentor, coach, and guide you'll ever be so grateful to yourself that you hired and the other aspect is because it is so unusual, I only work with people who are looking for the cutting edge, who are not satisfied with slow and steady two, three, five, ten percent returns. They want it all. They yeah. want 30 percent or 100 percent. In fact, if you go to a, you look like this guy, too. You look like Caleb Jones, who's one of my VIP clients. I increase his closings by over 600 percent in 90 days. That sounds crazy. Wow. But if you. If you go to paulrossresults.com, you'll notice two things. First, he looks a lot like you. You could be a cousin. <laughs> and also, you'll see his testimony is true. It's accurate. It's completely believable because it is true. And he'll tell you how I did what I did. So, yeah, I am in love with this stuff. I think you can see I'm very precise yeah. with it. And that it's also uh, a great joy to to share it and I deserve to be ritually roofed. <laughs> yeah. I mean, do you, um, do you think that those are skills that are transferable t to anyone or do you think there's a, a only... no, they're okay. not. Okay. So you, you so there might be clients you might not take on because absolutely you, you have to absolutely. You, even if you easily now see the advantage in applying to work with me, which I, you have to download the book, read the book. There's, a link where you can click to apply to work with me. Even if you have the money, you can't, I can't help you if you're, I'm just gonna say this, if you only want to think inside the box, I will disconnect the dots, color outside the lines, draw on the walls. This is a batshit crazy, topsy-turvy, tumble down the rabbit hole way of completely looking at sales differently and it's like learning a new language so if you are not on the cutting edge if you're not the kind of salesperson or entrepreneur or business owner who says you know what i'm not happy with my personal best i want to beat my own personal best and i really love the clients who are very competitive it's not enough for them to win they want to hear their competitors women and children weeping and wailing and crying they want to hear their bones crunching as they crush them completely i like drive so you have to be smart you have to be driven and you really have to be willing to take on a radically different way of doing things and you have to put in the work i make things as as easy as possible but there's no energy as my coach jaden says there's no easy energy and easy there's energy and ease. And the two, I don't want to get into the distinction. But it is a challenging thing. I will do my very best. And I do my very best to make it quickly adaptable and inject that into the client's DNA of their sales system. You know, one thing yeah, that I, yeah, one thing I, that I thought, I kind of going back a little bit to the back to the seduction stuff, one thing that I think is really interesting is it seems like from from what I've seen that a lot of times that leads to you know when you start learning you know pick up or whatever that leads to um, more self improvement and more uh, getting better at other right. areas of your life. But yeah, I mean it seems like that was a, that's a good start for a lot of people because maybe that was your your shortcoming. You know maybe you just you never were able to get a girlfriend or whatever, and then you start there. That gives you a little confidence and just kind of snowballs. Yeah, snowballs I know that to be true. One of the inspirations I had to create what I created is that I started to get emails from people saying, thank you, I met my wife, the women of my dreams. Sometimes they'd include pictures of their kids. And then they'd say, by the way, I've been using your stuff in sales and I've tripled my commissions and I'm, and I'm beating everyone in the company. Uh, it's amazing, Ross, Paul, how easy it is to use this for sales. And I thought, hey, he's right. What a fucking idiot you are. And there's a lot more money in the pockets of salespeople to be transparent. Let's have some fun mapping it over. And so that's what I did. 
I would assume the the reverse is true too. You know, you you uh, you learn the sales side, and all of a sudden you get better with. I the, can't uh, speak into that. That may be true. I can't speak into that. That's not. I don't know. I'm not saying it's false. I'm saying I don't have the data. To, it seems intuitively to be true. Yeah, you're uh, you're such a persuasive guy. One thing that I thought was hilarious was uh, I I watched your <laughs> I watched your interview with I can't think of her last name, but with Pearl. Um, oh yeah, I and, trounced and, her. I, her <laughs> I like was going to say I, like she changed drug. her opinions on like everything right on in real time on her own show, and I'm just like, I wow, it pretty good, didn't I? <laughs> that was great. <laughs> well, I prepared. I prepared beforehand and I knew her positions and I knew they were untenable and uh, I knew how to poke holes in them. But I started out by praising her. I was not adversarial. Yeah, I noticed that. Yeah. Basic. And, you know, it's true. I, I put, it was true. She ought to be proud of her work ethic and her family yeah, sure. ought to be proud of it. I think she's full of shit. Uh, it doesn't mean she doesn't work hard at it. Is her is her belief? I didn't. I don't really know a whole lot about her, but is her beliefs kind of based off? Is it more of like a like an evangelical background? Is that kind of what? Uh, it, there's some of that that's invaded the whole red pill tradition. Trad. Oh, woman. she's red pill. Okay. Okay. I, I, Not entirely, but she's a little bit into red pill and the trad woman movement and all the. Well, it gets dangerous where it slops over into Christian nationalism. All right. Well, I actually I, I asked before the interview. I. Uh, I put a thing out and asked if, because um, just because I thought it'd be fun, if any if any women would want to uh, throw some questions for me for me to mm -hmm. ask you. So I thought it'd be kind of fun for me to, or for us to do yeah. that. Is that is that all right with you? Okay. So the first question was, what experiences led you to view sex and dating as completely transactional? Well, there's, <laughs> I don't accept the premise. <laughs> I do not accept the premise of their question. Okay. Who are three women that you respect and why? Oh, my sisters. I'm not going to name my sisters. My sisters are incredibly accomplished, intelligent, brilliant, honorable hearts of gold. My two sisters and uh, my coach and trainer who's transformed my body, who I just absolutely madly love. My physician, Anna, who's restored me to health. I mean, I don't look 65 or, or I, does my energy seem like a 65 year old man's? No. And I yeah. feel you there. And that's, that's kind of why I date younger girls because I just, I don't, I can't resonate with the whole, let's sit and watch Jeopardy and work crossword well, puzzles. You know, like it's just not my thing. Yeah. So yeah, of course, but respect has to be earned. I'm not going to say I respect anyone as a race or a gender, although it's a, oh, it's no secret that I am. In fact, Jewish, yay. Uh, <laughs> I'm proud of my Jewish heritage, even though I'm an atheist, because we're two-tenths of a percent of the world's population, but look at the contributions we've done. Absolutely. We're about 25% of Nobel Prize winners in science, so something's going on. Man. Well, that's one it's thing you got to love about Christians. You know, we're big supporters of y'all. <laughs> Yeah, as long as you are, as long as you continue to try to convert us, that's the ulterior motive. But let's keep oh, going. Oh, I don't know. <laughs> okay, I gotta try that. I gotta walk up to a woman wearing a big cross and smoking hot and say, "I'm one of God's chosen." So, okay. So before I ask this one, um, something that really bothers me, and I know it has to bother you too, is men that claim to be feminists. Like when I hear a man say, "I'm a feminist," like it does something to me. Anyway, I, so I run when I hear that. I immediately run to the to the CVS or the Rite Aid, and I get some tampons for them to put in their mangina. <laughs> <laughs> Matter of fact, I was gonna play the little clip, but I I'm sure it's been done so many times. But the talk show from back in the day, you know, the, I can when play you, it. I don't care. Yeah, okay, put keep it, it to like a minute because I, you know, I've yeah, you gotta, time. yeah, you gotta go, and I don't have it. I don't have it narrowed down, but but there was that feminist guy on there, the one that was all you know in, in the suit and everything, and that was before I had ever heard. I mean, people didn't, men didn't really say they were feminists then, so I thought that was kind of strange. But anyway, okay, and then, so the last I'm one, suspicious of any ideology that's orthodox that admits to no exceptions that 
uses as their only tactic shouting down or name calling or shaming people who disagree rather than getting into the facts and issues and that sort of thing. I'm highly suspicious of any of that. I'm as suspicious of Orthodox Judaism as I am of uh, fund fundamentalist Christianity. I, I, I'm, as someone who's not authoritarian, but authoritative, authoritarianism in any form, religious, political, personal, just puts me off my food. I don't like it. I smell... I smell lies and bullshit because if you really have something to say that's true, useful, etc., you don't need to be authoritarian and hold the threat of punishment over people or shaming or shunning if they disagree. Okay, so that last question says, uh, how would how would you respond to the feminist idea that the patriarchy also hurts men and that the demands and limits on masculinity are harmful? I don't even know what patriarchy would define patriarchy. Patriarchy, Voltaire, right. If you're going to dispute with me. Well, I would say, if I were to guess, I would I say... Could, please I, allow me to answer your question. Um, respectfully, please, uh, I want to be able to answer. Voltaire said, the famous French philosopher and playwright and comedian and political commentator, said, if you're going to dispute or debate with me, you must first define your terms. So I don't know what that person means by that term. What did they mean? They're not present for me to interrogate them. What does patriarchy even mean? I don't know what they mean by that. Does it mean that men have more responsibility? Does it mean that men have more rights? I don't know what the fuck that person means. Did you uh, did you have anything else that you wanted to add as far as, um, as, far as the subconscious sales advantage or anything like that? Um, yeah, so... The book will teach you five basic principles that will change your entire outlook on selling, that by itself adapting them, well, you'll see some nice increases in your sales without having to make extra effort. And there's some chapters in there that give word for word language patterns that you can go out and use and, and see results for yourself. One of the things, one of the challenges that I have transparently marketing my stuff is it seems so outlandish and counterintuitive that there's no reason for a person to stop. And naturally and easily, find your own reasons to believe what it is I'm saying. But as that were to happen right now, that's why I believe I have to give stuff away for free. People say, where's your evidence? And I have great testimonials. You'll see them on paulrossresults.com. But the best evidence is someone's own results. You can't argue with your own results. So that's why the book has, I think, like three or four word-for-word -word language patterns. Particularly, it's got some stuff in there on crushing objections. So the objection, I need more time to think it over, and I need to talk to my spouse. <laughs> I have some ways to crush that entirely. So you can get instant access to the book. Again, there's the QR code. Scan it. Scan it. Or go to paulrossbook.com. You'll get the book and a little uh, and a little bonus PDF. But the best way to get it, just scan it. Use modern technology. <laughs> Fantastic. And uh, we'll see you on the other side. All right. Well, thank you so much for being with me and taking that. I know you're busy, so I really appreciate it. I was excited when you said you'd come on the show. It, whether I agree with everything that they think or not, like anybody that is um, adamant about what they believe and they can back it up, I respect and i even respect even more when you don't you don't care whether I, i'm okay or they're i love that you know authenticity is awesome so i i, I care there's a woman who i remember this a female friend brought her up to my place when we were talking i looked into her mind and her heart and i sensed what she needed in that moment and i communicate with her in a way and she said you know what you're really attractive in a way that's very intimidating. I said, what do you mean? She said, you care deeply about other people, but you don't give a fuck about what other people think about you. And I said, really? So what do you want to do about it? And so uh, she said, I don't know. I said, I know. And we just started going at it. And she said, no, no, I've got to get out of here. If I don't get out of here, I'll do something I regret. And she literally ran out the door. All right, sir. Well, I will let you get to your uh, to your next meeting. But again, thanks a lot. I'll make sure. I'm going to take a little nap. I need about 15, 20 minutes news with my cats. I'm a crazy cat guy. For those of you also who want to 
see more of my brilliance, tune into my podcast, The Influencer's Edge. Yep, we'll put that we, on there. We have interviewed people who I've interviewed two C ex CIA case handlers, an FBI special ex FBI special agent, my friend Chase, who teaches interrogation, resistance to interrogation, and some other kind of stuff to intelligence agencies, private businesses. It's it's all really interesting stuff. I gotta let you go. I need a bit of a nap. Thanks for having me on. Thank you. Thank you much.